A quick announcement. We've got some cool EerieCast and Freaky Folklore shirts in stock at EerieCast.store. Get them fast before they go out of stock. Today's episode was going to be just about scary fishing stories, but things got a little out of hand. Now you're getting sea monsters, scary fishing trips, and even a demon or two. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails if you want to discuss those weird farm fires, explosions, and such. I hope you enjoy this sort of water-themed episode, and be sure to send me your scary trucker story soon at darkstories.org. You can also send your work stories there too, if you want to be featured on Tales from the Break Room. As always, you can find more scary goodness at eeriecast.com. Now, let's begin. What Lurks Beneath the Waves From Wereful Dragon I'll be forward with you. The ocean can be a dangerous place. Between waves, storms, sea life, and other vessels, it's not surprising working in the water can lead to some pretty crazy stories. I was a long-line fisherman in the Gulf of Mexico from 2013 to 2018, and I have many stories that could be told, but this story is why I quit. It began like any other trip, String gear, packing the hull full of food, ice for the long and arduous trip to catch a check. When we finally shoved off, I was excited to see the stars and feel the crisp ocean air, salt kissing my face. It took three days to reach our numbers and drop our first line. We generally did six to seven a day. Now, one of the best parts about fishing in the Gulf is all the bioluminescent plankton which gather on calm nights and babble up against the hull. And when you lie down, the water carries you into sleep like a mother rocking their child. I've always enjoyed it. Now, nothing really happened out of the ordinary for the first 12 days we were out. Nothing but calm weather and seas with an abundance of grouper to fill the hull. But that all changed on the 13th day. That morning we woke up to a storm warning and had to rush to pull our chute, which was a type of underwater parachute that allows us to drift with the currents in case a storm blows through in the night. We rode into the waves for two and a half hours before we got clear of that storm. Once we made sure we were ship shape, we checked our GPS. We found out our position was above an underwater lake that I can't for the life of me remember the name of. However, I do remember my captain called it the Devil's Eye. I asked him why he calls it that, and the only thing he said was that there was something strange about this area. It was just before dawn and on calm seas when we felt a bump on the bottom of the boat. Now, normally it wouldn't have been a thing due to the periodic dips in the sea from the current, but this was nothing like that. I looked over towards my captain, expecting to see him shrug, but he looked pale. Then another bump happened, and all of us, save for my captain, started looking over the side to see if we could see what the culprit was. However, the darkness covered whatever it was that was doing this. We decided as a crew to start setting a few hours early, since we were all up. After a lot of coaxing, my captain reluctantly turned the boat and running lights on, which included the floodlights we used to fish at night. When they came on, I heard a gasp from one of our greenhorns, and when I looked, he was pointing at something. I followed his finger, and I saw it too. There was a single eye the size of a large plate, maybe 12 inches to 14 inches across, the same color of amber. It was maybe 5 feet under the hull, which was treading about 8 foot down. We stood there, staring at this massive eye for about four minutes when we felt the boat start shaking and beginning to rise out of the water. We all stood there watching as this thing kept rising and just when it crested the water, I saw the skin. It was the color of midnight stars and all but dull, if that makes any sense. And that's when my captain came out of the cabin with a shotgun. He walked over to us looking like a madman 
He eyed the beast and pointed the shotgun at it while bracing himself like he's done this countless times before. He told us to hold on before firing off a shot into the creature. The sound that came next I can only describe like this. Imagine a room full of guitars at max setting with feedback on. Yes, it hurt. I felt like my head was going to explode and tears poured from my eyes. The creature dove down, dropping us back in the water with a thud so hard I thought the hull had cracked. My captain ran into the cabin, throwing it in gear. We got out of there as quickly as we could, watching behind us for about 50 miles before he finally asked us if we wanted to continue the trip. We all said no, saying we needed to go home. We unloaded, got paid, and personally, I never went back. I have no idea what that thing was, and I still have trouble going out and not being able to see shore. I don't think I'll ever be able to go back out there, because I know what lurks beneath the waves. Orcas Island Lake Dragon From Sea Philly 100 Back in 2015, I lived on Orcas Island, Washington, which is in the San Juan Islands northwest of Seattle. It's a truly amazing place if you ever get the chance to go there. Killer whales are a regular sight in the Salish Sea, where deep channels harbor giant octopus and all manner of aquatic flora and fauna. Just don't get caught in a whirlpool caused by the ever-changing tide as it churns through the islands. In the middle of the island is a deep freshwater lake called Cascade Lake. Some friends and I had spent an amazing summer swimming, lounging on the beach, cliff jumping into the deep blue water. One evening, we were doing just that, jumping off a small wooden bridge and getting attacked by these little fish, which would swim up and nip at you. I'm not sure if we were invading their breeding ground or what, but I've never seen fish like that before or since. Anyway, there were about five or six of us, plus my two dogs at the time. The sun was hanging low, and quickly dipping out of sight. Sundown was pretty late that far north by northwest. It was fixing to be a clear and cool late summer night. The first thing that tipped me off that something was off was that we had walked around the shoreline to get out onto some rocks that were right on the water. But my dog, Duke, was still back at the bridge. So when he saw where we'd gone, he dove into the water, and I swear he swam so hard and fast that it looked like he was literally running across the surface of the water. This is a dog that was not a fan of getting wet, so that alone was strange, and when he got up onto the shoreline, he was visibly spooked. My friend mentioned that there was a cool-looking stump, or rather upturned root ball, about 20 yards or so, farther down along the shoreline, out of sight from the rocks. So I walked over to investigate. I studied the root ball, which actually looked like a giant dragon's head. At that angle, it looked as if it had two horns and a dragon-like face. I thought that was pretty neat. I made a mental note of it. Then I began to climb back down around the rocks when something, call it instinct, told me to stop and turn around. About five feet from me in the water was a big log that hadn't been there before. Only it wasn't a log at all but some sort of creature that was almost camouflaged to look like one. It had a mossy face and all, but you could just make out a serpentine head with a scaly snout and reptilian eyes on the side, with something that looked to be ears, maybe, pinned against the back of its head like a horse when it's angry. Or perhaps it was spiny flesh. My reaction was one of pure terror, adrenaline flooding my veins as my fight-or-flight instinct kicked in. Just then, my two dogs, Cookie and Duke, came over and saw the thing in the water next to me. They started running back and forth, frantically, barking and bluff-charging the water. I was worried that this thing might try to attack them, so I put myself in between it and the shoreline. I then slowly backed up away towards my dogs, who continued to go crazy. I ran back to grab my friend, but when we got back to the spot, the dragon log was gone. 
The following day, I asked a friend who grew up outside of Bellingham if he'd ever heard of water dragons or something to that effect. I kid you not, without even skipping a beat, he admitted that they used to have to tie up goats near the water on the lake where he lived to keep the dragons at bay. He had no time to cook up the story on the spot to mess with me, and it really seemed like he was being sincere and serious. This guy had never been the time to fool around like that. What makes the story more interesting is that in 2014, a man was discovered dead in his tent, covered with odd bite marks all over his body, right by those very same rocks. However, there are no natural predators on the island, so their best guess was that a family of otters had broken into his tent and bitten him to death. Yeah, whatever, otters. One last point, my girlfriend at the time who had grown up on the island told me that one day she was driving by the lake and she herself had seen the dragon swimming around in the lake in a similar manner to that of the Loch Ness Monster. These lakes are extremely deep and connect out to the sea by way of natural subterranean tunnels. My theory is that these dragons are actually ancient sea serpents. Maybe they survived the meteor blast that killed the dinosaurs by living underwater, and they travel the earth by way of these tunnels until they find a good place to live, like Cascade Lake, where there's plenty of food and it's easy to hide. A couple of years ago, I was listening to another story in which a person had seen one of these camouflaged sea creature things that looked at first like a log until it stood up on four legs and walked up out of the lake. Anyway, no one ever believes me when I tell them I saw this thing, but I thought my fellow listeners here might enjoy it. Stay safe out there by the water. Dogfish in the River, Dog Man on the Bank From Fishing King 79 This took place last fall on the shores of the Des Plaines River in Illinois. I am an avid fisherman, and I try to get out there whenever I can. On this particular day, my friend Nick and I were fishing the evening bite, hoping to catch some fall sauger and northern pike. As dusk approached, it got eerily quiet. The birds stopped singing and the crickets stopped chirping. It was beyond silent. I found it strange and I said to Nick, Hey, did you hit the mute button or something? He responded, No, but now that you mention it, it is suddenly really quiet. It stayed that way for about 30 minutes until we heard what sounded like grunting coming from the opposite shoreline. Nick asked me, What the heck is that sound? And all I could honestly answer was, I don't know, man. As it was across the water from us, we both just kind of shrugged it off and kept on fishing. About an hour later, just as the sky was starting to get dark, we heard the grunting start up again, but a lot louder like it was closer to us. I won't lie, this definitely had my attention. I started trying to see if I could see any movement in the woods, but I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary, until a tree across the water from us began to shake. It was like someone was shaking it slowly back and forth. As an outdoorsman, I remembered that when deer are in the rut season, they'll sometimes rub off of trees that would also explain the grunts too. I looked at Nick and said, Oh, I think I know what it is. Bambi's dad is trying to get his freak on. To which Nick laughed. We felt a bit better after that. But then the grunting stopped and it was replaced by what can only be described as a blood-curdling, extremely deep and very angry-sounding howl. I've heard coyotes and wolves howl before but I don't think even the biggest of them could have made this sound. Nick and I looked at each other, both of us having that what in the world look on our faces. Now I'm a veteran, so I don't scare easily, but I was definitely worried at this point. I was starting to want to reach for my sidearm, but I decided not to. 
Two trees across the water from us began to shake violently then, and another howl bellowed out. I drew my gun from its holster then. The thicker of the two shaking trees suddenly creaked and snapped, and it came crashing down hard and fast. More than half the tree landed in the water, soon submerging into it. What was standing where the tree once was chilled me to my core. I've only seen something like that in Wisconsin 34 years back. It was dark brown and gray in color. It had pointed longer ears, a thick mane, and an elongated snout. Even though it was 50 yards away from us, it was so big I felt small looking at it. I knew what it was right away. I'd heard stories and legends. Dog man. I'm not sure if it was hungry or if we were in its territory, but it definitely seemed to have bad intentions on its mind. I told Nick, let's slowly pick up our gear. We don't want to draw any more attention from it. We were about halfway through gathering our things when it began to run towards us. The thing jumped and landed on the exposed tree in the river. It looked like it was trying to find a way across the river to us. Nick then said, Screw the gear, man, let's book it. I'd paid way too much for my gear. If the dog man wanted it, he or she was going to have to kill me for it. I raised my gun in the air and fired three shots, trying to scare it off. And, to my amazement, it worked. We picked up our things and ran to the car. We got the heck out of Dodge. Hopefully, the rest of my fishing trips from here on out will be dog man free. The following story is from an older episode that didn't get a lot of attention, but I've been looking for scary fishing stories, so it fits. I experienced something on a fishing trip. From Zach. This happened several years ago, after I had just turned 14. My father, my uncle, and I went on a night fishing trip. My father and uncle invited me to a fishing trip to mark my coming of age. I always begged to go with them, but I had been too young up until then. They went night fishing on the full moon of every month. The full moon was supposed to attract bigger fish. I don't know how true that is, but that's what I've been told. And after that particular night, when we caught no fish, I was especially skeptical about that claim. But we did, however experienced something that forced us to get back to shore as quickly as possible. Dad and I had packed our gear and drove to my uncle's to pick him up. We got to the docking yard around 11 p.m. that night. Then we began packing our gear onto the boat. The fishing boat was small, but it fit the three of us comfortably. My dad and uncle had rigged a 200 horsepower engine on it when they bought it so it could go pretty fast. We left the dock nearing 12 p.m. when the moon was straight above us. Its moonlight illuminated our way to the fishing spot. They made me swear to keep their spot a secret, as if I knew how to get back here myself. On the other hand, this did make me feel accepted, so I was very happy to agree. We were roughly two miles out, when the boat started to slow down. We're here, my dad said. It was impressive how they could come back to the same spot again when there were no landmarks, only small islets far off in the distance. It only later occurred to me that these boats were equipped with computerized coordinates. I'd never been so far out to sea. With no lights around us, the moon looked more full than ever, presenting details I'd never noticed on it before. It offered us enough light to get our fishing rods out and ready. It was quiet out there. At this time, there were no other boats around, only the sound of the sea and wind. Obviously, there were no crickets out there on the water. We were all on one side of the boat. My dad and uncle had their lines cast while I worked on tying and baiting my hook. It was then that I heard a splashing on the opposite side of the boat, I dropped what I was doing and went over to see if it was a dolphin. They were common around this time of year, 
but rarely seen at night. I looked into the water on the side of the boat. There was no dolphin or fish, but there was a glowing blur of redness coming from deep below. It's hard to explain, but it glowed similar to a fire and seemed to be moving downward as it quickly faded out of sight. The two of them asked me what it was, but I didn't want to explain what I saw, as I thought that they wouldn't believe me, so I just said it was nothing. As I turned away from the water, something hit the boat hard from underneath with a loud bang. The boat shook. It was like a cannonball had hit the boat from underneath. My dad and uncle both cursed. I dropped to the floor in shock. We had no idea what could have done that. They said maybe it was a shark, but I was thinking there was no way a shark would slam and rock a boat so hard. But the anxiety and fear of the situation was enough for us to go to another spot. My uncle and dad began to pull up the anchor. They got the anchor up, and I looked back into the water where I'd previously seen the red glow. It was there again now, but this time, I quickly called the other two over to see it. They definitely saw it and could not decipher what it could be. It seemed to be getting bigger, and we realized whatever it was was moving upward, fast. We knew we had to get out of there. The boat sped away, and we seemed to be in the clear. But when I looked behind us, I could still see it, just below the surface of the waves the boat made. It was there in the water, and it was chasing us. I was frightened more than I've ever been in my life. We were in the vast open sea with whatever hit our boat from below, right behind us. My dad reached maximum speed. The boat seemed to hit every swell head-on, throwing the vessel into the air, causing it to violently land back on the surface of the water. We all were holding on to something by then, otherwise we would have been thrown overboard, which would mean we'd get to experience what that thing in the water was behind us. While my dad drove, I kept myself as low as possible, gripping anything I could. My uncle screamed at it, asking what it wanted, as though it had a conscience. Looking back on it now, I'm pretty sure that whatever it was, I believe it meant to do us harm. We got to around three minutes from the shore when it was no longer behind us. In our fear, we left everything on the boat and jumped onto the dock as fast as we could. The dockyard worker asked us what all the hustle was about, but we didn't really know what to say. We told no one. After all, it was an extremely frightful, yet unbelievably strange encounter. One that people would probably doubt. I'm in my twenties now. I've drunkenly told this story once or twice, but people usually laugh about it. Just some drunken tale. That was the last time any of us went out to sea at night, and never again to the same spot. We still have those coordinates saved, not to go back, but to avoid it at all costs. A dragon nearly dragged my brother into the river. From Dragon Crystal I remembered this story after hearing on Spotify of the girl whose mom was attacked by a dragon while leaving Laos to Thailand because my brother could have also been attacked and pulled into a river by a dragon disguised as a fish. Some backstory is that my parents and relatives believe that dragons will disguise themselves as other creatures such as fish or lizards. So if you kill something of the sort, don't talk about it too much. Because if it's a dragon, their relatives will come to get revenge on you. Because we've heard stories from our grandma about dragons coming and destroying villages or drowning people who unknowingly kill their children or family members. Our neighborhood was having their annual community event that week. We usually attended to have fun as well as watch the fireworks later. It was around noon or so, 
and they were having a fishing contest for kids from ages 3 to 12, where the kids get to fish for an hour or more, and then the judges will weigh and measure the fish, giving prizes for the top three biggest catches. Since Vivi, my youngest brother, was turning 13 soon, he decided to take part one last time. I was helping our other cousin, Ellie, at a different part of the river. Our other brother, Kirito, was just a couple of feet away from Vivi, also helping a different cousin named Lizzie, while our dad and uncles were assisting some other cousins much farther from us. After about half an hour of no bites on our end, we gave up, getting bored after waiting so long. We decided to head back to where Vivi was at. I then noticed Kirito was also heading back with the other cousin he was helping out. Suddenly, I saw Vivi was struggling to pull his line in. He began to call for help. But since I was still pretty far from where he was, I quickened my pace, pulling our cousin along because I didn't want to leave them behind. Luckily, Kirito was nearby, so I left my cousin with him and went to check on Vivi. By then, Vivi was literally teetering on the grass just above the water. I was halfway to him. Kirito, after dropping the cousins off with their mom, sprinted towards Vivi as well. Soon enough, both of us were there, wrapping our arms around him to keep him from being pulled in. With the three of us, we managed to pull the fish out of the water and onto the grass. All of us were baffled by how strong this fish was. Our dads heard Vivi yelling for help and they made it to us. They undid the fishing line from the fish's mouth before dropping it into the bucket with water in it to be weighed later. It wasn't long before the judging started. Sadly, the fish Vivi caught was far too heavy for him to carry, so I volunteered to help him carry it to the judge's table. As I walked, I noticed the way he was looking at the fish. His expression was odd. When we made it to the table with the fish, I also noticed it was a bit weird looking. It looked more like a pike, which was not common in that river. At the largest, there's just some catfish here and there, but nothing bigger. Our uncle looked into the bucket too. He also had a surprised look on his face. He said to us, Wow, that's huge. Well, we let the judges know who did the fishing. Vivi wrote his name on the bucket. After that, we quickly walked back to our parents to await the results. Minutes passed by and the judges called out. Vivi had won first place. The winners walked up to claim their prizes and the judges dumped the fishes into clear containers for everyone else to see. A lot of people who saw Vivi's fish were whispering about how big it was, and the judges claimed it was either a very big northern pike, bourbon, a herring, muscalunge, trout, or even a very large lake sturgeon. One of the parents even commented it looked like a barracuda, but the judges denied that. After each kid picked out their prizes, which were fishing tackle boxes and fishing poles, they were asked if they wanted to keep their fishes. Vivi quickly shook his head, so Vivi's fish was dumped back into the water. It wasn't until years later that Vivi finally admitted that the reason he was yelling for help wasn't because he was struggling so much to pull the fish out of the water, it was because he had noticed the fish was staring right up at him before it began to try to pull him into the water. And as Vivi was about to fall in, he saw teeth. Teeth that didn't belong to a fish. Teeth that were far too sharp and large. Vivi was scared of what could have happened, especially if we hadn't helped him. That's also the reason he was so quick to have the fish dumped back in the water. He didn't want dragon revenge coming back to him and his family. The most terrifying thing to ever happen to me from Angel of Death. This happened when I was 17, so maybe four years ago now. I'll tell you what I saw and what my best friend experienced, because it happened to him. I was simply there watching it all unfold. I live on a hill in Ohio, about a 10 minute drive away from any village or town. My property consists of 10 acres of nothing but woods, that's all mine. Past that, I'm not sure who owns it, but it's covered in forest, which goes on as far as the eye can see in any direction you look. At the time, I'd invited my friends over to fish and party. 
I'd brought about three to four friends over, and my brother and cousin were there too. My friends and I were smoking up. We had a bonfire back by the pond, which was about 500 feet away from my house. We began fishing, talking about how school was going and girls and all that. Classic teenage boy stuff. While this was going on, two of my friends were in my house fooling around with a Ouija board. I didn't know about this until I went back inside about two hours later. We sat inside watching scary movies. At this point, we'd been up pretty much all night and the sun was about to come up. It still wasn't bright out though, but there was just enough light coming through you could walk outside and see just fine without a flashlight. My friend, John, said that he was going to go outside on my front porch and get some air and watch the sunrise. The rest of us sat inside, besides two of my friends. One went outside with my cousin, and they headed over by the garage. The garage was pretty far from my front porch. I'm not sure the exact distance, but it's far enough where if people were talking on the porch, you would not be able to hear them. The rest of us stayed inside for about ten more minutes, when, out of nowhere, my best friend John came running back in, slamming the door shut behind him, he was screaming at the top of his lungs. He was saying something like, what in the holy heck was that? Over and over. I was the first to ask, dude, what is wrong with you? John and I have been friends our whole lives, and I still have never seen him as scared as I did that day. We got him calmed down within a couple of minutes where he was actually capable of explaining what happened. He said that he had gone outside grabbed a chair and sat down. He was scrolling through Facebook when he heard everything go quiet all of a sudden. He tried not to think much of it. Suddenly, he got this instinctual feeling that he needed to run, that if he didn't, he was going to get attacked. He glanced over, and he saw it. This creature, which he described as eight to eight and a half feet tall. At first, I didn't know if I believed him or not, but like I said, I've never seen him so scared. I believed he definitely saw something, but an eight-foot-tall goat man with red eyes? Nah, I thought, no way. I paused, unsure of what to make of my friend's wild claims, until my cousin and another friend returned from outside, confirming that they had seen something too, something with black fur which bolted across the yard at an alarming speed. I'd been with my friends all night, so I knew this wasn't made up. There's no way they came up with it outside because we would have heard them talking about it. We'd all been sitting in the living room, and anyone walking on the front porch would have been loud enough for us to hear. I know what you're thinking. You guys were smoking and you were probably all still high. Your friends were seeing or feeling things. But at the point when this all happened, we hadn't smoked in four hours, if not more. So I don't think it was that. Ever since that day, whenever I go outside, I always get the feeling I'm being watched, especially when I'm sitting on the porch. Now, you can choose to believe this story or not, but I swear on everything that it happened. Help, I'm scared. From My Name is Mara I live in northern Norway, as far east as you can go. This place is known to be cursed, or Ghana, as we say. My town especially, as we're one of the biggest cities here, with about 4,000 residents. For you to understand the story, and why this city is known to be cursed, I have to tell you about it. In World War II, German soldiers came here from Russia. They burned down our towns, coming with a large warship called Torpitz, to shoot the residents that lived here. The residents were all fishermen. 70% were Sami, that is the indigenous people of Norway, and the other 30% were Kvins, Finnish immigrants. As you could guess, the Sami had a lot of spiritualism in their culture. They have their own kind of skinwalker, and shamans played a big part in their lives. Of course, since shamans are so important to them, 
Most Sami people know how to curse someone. So when the Germans came to burn down the city, the Sami people, with the help from Russia, built caves and bunkers. Some of them are still located on an island here, 700 meters from the mainland. Long story short, they burned down most of the town, but not everything. Our bunkers still stand on the island, along with an unmarked graveyard full of our Sami people. This is where my story starts. My family and I had visited the island and those bunkers since we were kids. World War II is a big part of northern Norway's history, and our town is known for having so many historical sites from when the Nazis were here. Growing up, it was normal for us to visit the bunkers and underground tunnels with our school, and I've been there about a couple hundred times now, sometimes to explore with friends, sometimes just a quick visit before going fishing. The mines are damp, slimy, and smelled rotten. The scary part is that a massive area of our island is restricted because they suspect there might still be a couple of mines there. The last time someone found one was in the early 2000s. This also meant some bunkers and underground tunnels haven't been discovered just yet, at least by most people. My story starts when my boyfriend decided to move here. He's half Sami. It's important to state I'm not Sami at all. I'm half Russian. Our town is pretty dead, and pretty much nothing has gotten a new coat of paint since the 60s. I wanted to take my boyfriend on a trip to look at the island, to show him around, as this would be his first time out here. We visited the bunkers, and immediately he was freaked out. Now the bunkers are so damp there's slimy moss and rainwater all over, and of course there's hardly any light. These bunkers start out as bunkers, which lead farther along to split tunnels, which you follow up to two other bunkers and one of them has a lid on top of it that was moved when the soldiers had to evacuate. When we got there, my boyfriend hesitated to go inside with me, but eventually I talked him into it. The entire time, he said he had a sick feeling in his stomach, and he had a headache. I told him about the history of the place, and he got even more creeped out. As he is Sami, he is spiritual. He became so scared he insisted that we headed home. So I relented, and we did. Our home is on one of the oldest streets in town, and as I said, we still have houses left that did not burn down, along with Prestegarder, which is the old farmhouses from the 1600s. When we got back home, he called his mom and told her that he felt really sick in that bunker. She scolded him and told him about what the German soldiers would do to the Samis and told him to never go back because the Sami people had put a curse there. She told us that when a German soldier was killed in the bunkers, the Sami people would call for Sjora, a bird, to eat him so that he was tortured even after death. The Germans got so angry at the Samis they captured them, torturing them inside the bunkers because they believed all Samis were disciples of Satan. After that phone call, everything felt weird. Six months later, my boyfriend would complain about skinny tall men with helmets standing in the corners of our apartment, watching him. He's had sleep paralysis about three times a month, in which he hears men yell and swear at him in German, before the men in the shadows begin to walk towards him. He swears he's seen old rain boots in our hallway, has heard bangs like mine explosions, and he can't stand walking down towards the island because he feels like he will die if he goes there again. On the other hand, I only feel watched when I'm alone. We have a kitten who randomly jumps in the corners of our apartment, scratching at them before she jumps back, as if she's afraid of something. It feels like the curse has stuck to us, Next month, his mom is going to come with us to meet the family shaman. Hopefully, things will get better. Drunk Stalker in 1998 From Matthias Z 
This story goes way back to 1998, when I was 16 years old. I was with my two friends, Ben and Jake. It was a late summer evening on a Saturday. I was sitting in my room listening to some 80s rock, as teenagers back then would do. I got bored after some time and went outside to meet up with Ben and Jake. We chilled in Ben's garage for a while, drinking beer and smoking. We got bored pretty quick though, so we went out to do some more teenage crap. I remember we walked down this narrow path by the woods and down towards the lake. Back in the late 90s, there was a popular hangout spot for teenagers there, so we were hoping to see some other kids there. When we arrived, there was no one else there, just the sound of the crickets out in the tall grass. We sat for a while on a bench and just talked for about 15 minutes. Jake then said he wanted to go to an old fishing hut by the lake. We all agreed on going inside and exploring it. We went to the hut and entered. While Jake and Ben were walking around and breaking stuff, I could not shake the feeling of being watched. We went upstairs where there was an old wooden boat lying there, with a fishing net over it. We were kind of checking it out, when all of a sudden we heard the wooden door to the hut creak open. We could hear heavy footsteps entering down below, followed by heavy breathing. We all stopped dead in our tracks, nearly holding our breaths. There was around a five second break that felt like an eternity, when suddenly, a man spoke in a drunken voice. I know you're here. <laughs> Come out. Come out wherever you are, you little brats. The heavy footsteps started to walk towards the stairs as the old floor creaked underneath. Jake went inside the wooden boat and the rest of us followed. We put the fishing net over our heads and we didn't move. The man came upstairs and we could hear him stumbling around. I can hear you. <laughs> we sat dead still, but I could feel the fear in all of us. The man walked around and moved things, looking for us. I was thinking of a plan to escape without being caught, but we were literally like sitting ducks. Suddenly, we could feel the fishing net being ripped off. Here you are. Jake reacted the fastest, pushing him away so the man fell onto his back. We all ran like heck out of there, through the tall grass, back into the woods. We could hear the man giving chase, but he gave up, probably due to his drunken state. We all went back to Ben's garage and fell onto the couch in exhaustion. Jake then told us that the man dropped a knife when he fell on the floor. He must have been holding it the entire time. We all just sat in shock for the rest of the night, thinking about what nearly happened to us. To this day, I can't help but wonder what would have happened if Jake hadn't pushed the man back. Demon in the Doorway From Yo Stevo It seems that more people than one would think tend to experience some form of paranormal activity in their life. Some seem to be more fantastic than others, and believe me, I've heard my share of both. When I was 16 years old, I was spending the summer visiting with my Nana and Papa. That's grandparents for those who were not raised in the South. They lived on about 20 acres in a small town in central Oklahoma. There were miles of farmland all around, and neighbors were few and far between. Seriously, I mean their nearest neighbor lived almost a quarter of a mile away, and she happened to be my great aunt. It was extremely peaceful and quiet, although at night it could sometimes feel a little ominous. As you entered onto the property off the main road, there was a long gravel driveway leading up to the house. After about 80 feet, you could either go left and pull into the driveway, or continue straight and head towards the barn. About 100 yards beyond the barn was a gradual slope that separated a very large spring-fed pond from the main property, which, by the way, had some of the best wide-mouth bass and crappy fishing I've ever had in my life. 
Their house was a single-level, three-bedroom, two-bath, ranch-style home with an attached two-car garage. As you walked through the front door to the left of the garage, you entered the living room. To the left was a hallway that led to the bedrooms and bathrooms. The main bathroom was the first door on the right, and the guest room where I slept was the second door on the right at the end of the hall. My grandparents, of course, slept in the master bedroom, directly across the hall from my room. They had an attached bathroom which basically was only used by Papa, so it wasn't uncommon to see my Nana shuffle across the hallway in the middle of the night to use the other bathroom. She even kept a nightlight by the bathroom door for that very purpose. Now, to be honest, I don't scare that easily, and as I said, I've experienced the paranormal on several occasions, most of which happened at my old house in Utah. But those are stories for another time. Nonetheless, something about the hallway in particular at this house creeped me out. I would be sitting in the living room watching TV, and I would feel something watching me from the end of the hallway. My Nana kept an antique fabric doll on a small table at the end of the hall, and even though it looked somewhat creepy, it never really freaked me out. No, it wasn't that. It was something else, something foreboding, and I could feel it from time to time just leering at me, like it was intentionally trying to make me uncomfortable. One afternoon, I had just fed and watered the cows. I was eating lunch and watching some TV before going fishing. My Nana was in the kitchen and my Papa was out on his tractor, three miles away in the north pasture baling hay. As I took a bite of my sandwich, out of nowhere, I started to get that uncomfortable feeling again. Hesitantly, I looked left down that hallway and I swear to you, I saw that antique doll by itself turn completely to the right and it was now facing my grandparents' bedroom. I froze with my mouth shut mid-chew, jaw slacked open, trying my best not to make a big deal about it. I calmly went back to watching TV, but seconds later, I couldn't help myself but to look again. Nervously, I looked back down the hall, only to discover that the doll had now turned 180 degrees and was now facing my bedroom. There are no train tracks in this area, and the kind of vibrations it would take to cause that to happen would have been felt throughout the entire house. Needless to say, me and the rest of my sandwich left to go fishing immediately. Later on that night, long after my grandparents went to bed, I was getting tired myself and decided that I had delayed going to bed too long. I told myself I was being silly. There wasn't anything to really be afraid of. So I manned up and made my way toward the bedroom. I reminded myself along the way, it's no big deal, just go to bed. As I stepped through the doorway, I even made it a point to say quietly but out loud, you don't scare me, leave me alone. Well, challenge accepted, I guess. Now, I'm a very deep sleeper. In fact, once while I was visiting there on another occasion, I had literally slept through a tornado. Anyways, a short while after I'd fallen asleep, I shot right up in bed wide awake as if someone had urgently tried to get my attention. The bed I was sleeping in faced a closet, and if you looked slightly to the right, there was the doorway to the bedroom. I always slept with the bedroom door open, and if you looked out, all you could see was the hallway wall, which dimly reflected the nightlight from the bathroom. As I turned my head to look at the doorway, I saw a solid black human-shaped figure standing at the entrance. At first, I tried telling myself it was just my Nana stopping to look in on me on her way to the bathroom. But no, I knew that wasn't the case. I'd seen her make that trip in the middle of the night many times over, and it never looked like this. This thing, whatever it was, was darker than any shadow I'd ever seen in my entire life. It's so hard to put into words, but even though this thing was featureless, I could tell that it was staring right at me. And as horrifying as it was to look at, the feeling it gave me was even worse. I can't even begin to explain the level of negativity and evil that was emanating from it. And just as I was trying to process all of this, 
Suddenly, it made a motion like it was going to enter the room. In that same moment, as I lay there petrified, and knowing full well that any second this abomination was going to be even closer to me, it failed to breach the threshold. I mean, it's like something was preventing it from coming into my room. As ridiculous as it sounds, it's as if there was some sort of invisible force field preventing it from coming in. Not like that stopped it from trying, though. Over and over, it repeatedly attempted to come in. With every attempt, I grew more and more nervous and terrified that it was finally going to succeed. I thought about yelling out for help, but honestly, I didn't want to have them come rushing out only to discover nothing. Then I would have to try to explain this fiasco. Or worse, I would risk the chance of my grandparents actually encountering this thing. I didn't want them to die of a heart attack or get hurt or something like that. So the only thing I could think to do was pull the covers up over my head like a child and pray for God to take this thing away. I'm not an extremely religious person, but in that moment, it seemed like the right way to go. I mean, what else would you do? And don't give me the, I would have just blah blah blah. Bullcrap. You would have soiled yourself, nearly like I did. I didn't even peek out from under the covers to see if it was gone, because I just knew if I did, it either wouldn't be gone, or worse, it would be standing there right next to me, and I wasn't willing to roll those dice. I even pinched myself hard to make sure I wasn't just having a nightmare. I stayed there under the covers like that, praying until I finally went back to sleep. I woke up in the morning to the smell of bacon cooking the sun shining, and everything going back to normal. I debated calling my folks and having them put me on an earlier flight back home, but in the end, I decided that I wasn't going to let this experience ruin my summer vacation, denying me time with the people I loved. Well, I'm glad I stayed. My grandparents are both gone now. Leaving early would have been something I regretted doing for the rest of my life. I never saw that thing again. And strangely enough, the hallway didn't creep me out to the same level it used to anymore. I eventually did ask my Nana before she passed if she had ever experienced any weird activity there. She told me, Well, I've seen a couple of weird things, but if you don't pay it any mind, it'll leave you alone. Like I mentioned earlier, I've had several paranormal encounters in my life, but no matter how tough you think you are, or how much you think paranormal crap doesn't really bother you. Nothing prepares you for an experience like that. My Last Fishing Trip From Lil Mama 85 This happened to my Aunt Donna, my brother Eric, and I, one late summer day. I have to say, since this happened, we've not been back to this place to fish. It was summer. School was out. Eric and I were bored out of our minds. Our parents had divorced, and at the time we were living with our grandmother and Aunt Donna. We loved living with them because we always got our way. We were outside mopping around when Eric said that he thought going to fish would be a fun idea. I smiled and agreed. We went to ask Donna if we could go. So we did just that, and she thought it would be fine. If we caught anything, we could come back and have a fish fry outside. We ran together all our things, and Donna helped us load it all into the four-wheeler. I jumped on the back, Eric got on the front rack, and Donna was the driver. We set out then. Now, where we live, we don't have to go very far, maybe an hour or so to what we call the gully hole. I have no idea where the name came from, but it was this sandy river bank with a little pond of water that the river had created. Honestly, it's quite beautiful and peaceful there, but in order to get there, we have to ride one hour beside the train tracks. Did we care at the time? No way. It was our favorite spot to fish. Eventually, we arrived. We set up our poles. Everything was going great, but I was getting impatient, so I got up and started to collect seashells. I waded in the river away from Donna and Eric, all my attention was on the water at the time, looking down into the sand to find odd shells. 
Without knowing it, I ended up getting pretty far away from the other two, and when I looked up to the other side of the river, I saw something. Whatever I was looking at, it had two legs, and it walked like a man, but it was hairy like a bear. I couldn't quite make it out because it kept to the shadows and hid behind trees. When I felt a hand on my shoulder, I nearly jumped ten feet into the air, but I held back a scream. When I turned around, it was just Eric. He must have seen this thing too, because he stayed quiet and stared in the same direction as it. Quietly, I asked him what he thought it was. He shook his head and told me he wasn't sure. The thing must have been getting impatient because it began to throw rocks at us. There was no way the rocks could hit us being all the way across the river, but it clearly wanted us to go away. My brother got the idea that maybe we should back up and go up the shore a little ways. I agreed and we made our way back, but we never took our eyes off the thing. No sooner do we make it back to where Donna was, this thing comes out. I mean, it comes out to the riverbank, and we see it clear as day. I could not believe what I was looking at. Donna was in complete shock looking at the thing. It walked to the riverbank, bent down, and started to drink water. I look over at my brother, but he was gone. I began to look around for him. I found him a couple of yards down the river, but he had his rifle aimed at the thing. I panicked and began to run towards him. He was getting ready to shoot when I jerked the gun away from him, causing him to miss the shot. The gun went off and it fell to the ground. The sound of the shot echoed around us, and I could quickly tell that Eric was mad. I then looked to where the creature was, but it was already gone. I felt relieved. We suddenly heard this boom, boom, boom sound, like something was hitting something else. We looked around as the beating sound began to slowly grow all around us. Boom, boom, boom. It was behind us, in front of us, beside us. I was horrified. Without saying a word, my brother picks up the gun and we hightail it back to Donna, where she had already started packing everything up. It didn't take us long to throw everything back into the four-wheeler. We hopped on, and as we turned around, we heard something running in the woods all around us. I screamed for Donna to go, to get us out of here. At this point, I was crying like a two-year-old. Donna finally hit the gas to the four-wheeler, nearly throwing me off. We flew down along the train tracks like a bat out of heck. We made it home, and we told our grandma what happened. She sits all three of us down and tells us that it's quite an unbelievable story, that we probably just saw a bear or mountain lion. We looked at one another in silence. We all three agreed if we were going to tell people about what we saw, saying it was Bigfoot, people would think we were just crazy. So for years, this story hasn't been brought up, until now. I know what we saw that day, and I know it was real. No matter what anyone says, Bigfoot is out there, and I hope I never see him again. Creature Sighting While Fishing From Lemon Number 8869 I want to start off by saying this is a true story. I'm not too sure what I saw that night. This story took place three years ago on September 19th, 2020. I don't care much for location privacy so it was a small town called Los Bonos in California. This town is between Modesto and Sacramento and is surrounded by hills and mountains. It was my birthday, and I decided that I wanted to go night fishing with my dad, my older brother, and my friend, as it was a nice, warm night. Specifically, we went to a back road canal called Madera Road. This canal is surrounded by orchards of orange trees, Around 12.15, we first arrived at the fishing spot. But when we got there, my friend and I had this feeling that we shouldn't be there at all. It was a feeling that was difficult to explain, but you know when something is off. We ignored the feeling and decided to set up our fishing poles for the night. A little background on this spot. There are two canals, 
one on the left and one on the right, separated by a little ravine. We were fishing on the right side, so the ravine and the other canal were behind us. While we set up our fishing poles, I heard what seemed to be a high-pitched scream. It sounded like it was coming from the ravine. When I heard this, I looked over at my friend, who had apparently also heard it. But the weird part was my dad and older brother were right next to us, and yet they didn't hear a thing. This really scared us, but we brushed it off as just hearing things. I sat there looking at my fishing pole when I had this overwhelming urge to look behind me. I turned on my flashlight and I saw what looked to be two greenish-yellow eyes looking at me on the other side of the ravine. Instantly, I froze in place. I was able to see these eyes blink the same way a human does, but these eyes were only two feet off the ground. After staring at it for what felt like a few minutes, the eyes began to lift farther off the ground, as if whatever they belonged to had been crouching the entire time. These eyes rose to a height of seven feet and stopped. After that, I was able to see an outline. I saw arms which hung super low to the ground and it seemed to have really bad posture. I was frozen in fear, but in the corner of my eye, I could see my friend turning around. Then I saw him freeze instantly. He was looking in the same direction as me. The two of us looked at this creature, both of us petrified. This lasted for at least three seconds. That's when this thing began to turn around, taking a step out of reach from my light. As it did this, I unfroze, able to move again. Immediately, I looked over at my friend whose eyes were wide. He told me what he saw, and it matched exactly what I had seen. This encounter was brief, lasting only a minute or two. Within those minutes, my dad or brother didn't see anything, so they were shocked when my friend and I began to pack up everything in a hurry. I remember saying, we need to leave, over and over as we packed up our stuff. Once we made it back to the truck, my friend and I screamed at my dad to hurry and leave, and we did. However, since it was a dirt road next to the canal, we couldn't just speed off. Within the time it took us to get back onto the main road, I felt fear surging through me. Fear that I have yet to ever feel again. The canal where I saw whatever it was was only eight minutes away from my house. I was disturbed at the thought. I didn't sleep for three days, and when I did manage to nod off, I would instantly see that figure in my head. This whole experience was weird, because I always watched scary videos about strange creatures, and I never really thought they were real. Not until then. Now I fully believe these things exist. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an eerie cast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at eeriecast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.